Hello again, everybody. We are going to talk here about laryngitis. Laryngitis is extremely common. You will see it every year. Uh, it's common both in the pediatric population and the adult population. Um, when it happens in kids, and kids do have a predilection for it, uh, again, it has nothing to do with the fact that they are more predisposed to the pathogens that cause laryngitis, which are typically viral. Uh, what it has to do with is that they have smaller airways. And so because they have smaller airways, if there's any kind of swelling in their airways, the resistance is going to go up much faster than it would in an adult with a larger airway. So if that doesn't make any sense to you as to why that mathematically works out, uh, go ahead and uh, look at my lecture that I did on uh, airway mechanics. So these are the upper airway diseases in children that we're going to talk about. Uh, all of these things are acquired. So there are some uh, things that are airway diseases uh, that are uh, inherited or they're congenital. Uh, those can be things uh, like uh, thyroglossal duct cyst, vocal cord paralysis, congenital lesions such as coenal atresia, uh, webs, rings, uh, macroglossia, uh, micrognathia, uh, there's a lot of different things that can cause upper airway diseases in children. What we're focusing on here for now are the things that are acquired. Okay, so we'll talk about laryngitis here. This is primarily a, a viral disease. Uh, we'll also talk about, later on, we'll talk about croup, which is typically caused by the parainfluenza viruses. There's a subset of croup called spasmodic croup, which uh, may be caused by viruses um, and also has some allergic causes. It's a little bit different from croup. We'll sort that out when we get there. Uh, we'll talk about epiglottitis, which out of all of these, uh, save for perhaps form body obstruction, this presents a medical emergency. And this is typically caused by Haemophilus influenza type B, but because we're vaccinating kids against that now, uh, epiglottitis is becoming much more rare, and uh, the types of bugs that cause epiglottitis are widening. There's, when we see a patient with epiglottitis, it's less likely to be uh, Haemophilus influenza type B than it would have been 40 years ago. And then we'll talk about bacterial tracheitis and foreign body obstruction. So for here we're going to discuss laryngitis. And so looking at the larynx here on the left we have our anterior view of the larynx. So this is you're just looking straight at the neck and you've taken out the very uh, top of the trachea, the larynx, and then all the way down the, all the way up to the epiglottis. And the epiglottis attaches to the uh, thyroid cartilage and comes up just behind the tongue. So note that this is the hyoid bone right here and this just kind of just sits underneath your chin uh, a little bit behind. So you have four types of cartilage, four major types of cartilage. Uh, this is looking from the back here so you have your thyroid cartilage which uh, covers up the thyroid. Uh, you also have carniculate cartilage uh, which sort of forms these little horns back here. You have cricoid cartilage. Cricoid cartilage is notable because it is the only cartilage in the trachea uh, that, and in the larynx that forms a complete continuous circle, a uh, complete ring. And then you have the epiglottis, which is uh, similar tissue. <clears throat> so one thing I want to point out here is that when you are, and you certainly aren't going to need to do this in uh, patients who have laryngitis, but when you do a, an airway, if you're not able to do an orotracheal airway, uh, you may need to do a uh, tracheostomy. And if you do a tracheostomy, it's very important to know your landmarks, to know your where your thyroid cartilage is, the laryngeal prominence sits right on the thyroid cartilage. This is also known as the Adam's apple. So you'll feel for that, and then there should be a, sort of a softer place, and then you'll feel another bit of cartilage. And that soft space, uh, is the space in between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, and that is the cricothyroid ligament. And this is the ligament through which you're going to insert your catheter to do a tracheostomy. Okay, so I don't, you don't need to know too much about the anatomy here for the larynx, uh, but just sort of have an idea of it. And you can always come back here. Uh, other things I would point out would be uh, that down here you have your vocal cords, um, uh, the, the epiglottis is uh, sort of comes up. You, you can't see the direction that it faces, but the epiglottis sort of has a, it goes upwards and then it kind of goes back. Okay, so laryngitis, the cause is almost always viral in the industrialized world. Uh, so here it's going to be rhinovirus, parainfluenza virus, RSV, it can also be adenoviruses, influenza virus. Less commonly, you can see uh, from the measles virus, the mumps virus, varicella zoster, 
Uh, and then in the less industrialized world, you can see Bordetella pitussis. Um, also, you can see um, in the less industrialized developing world, you can see diphtheria as a cause of laryngitis. This is going to be easier to differentiate out. Now, first of all, we don't see this in the U.S. that much because people get their vaccines against diphtheria. However, uh, if you are dealing, for instance, with a patient uh, who didn't get vaccines, maybe they're immigrants, maybe their parents opted them out of vaccines, then diphtheria is something that you need to think of when you're suspecting laryngitis. And what you will see, and I don't have a picture of it on here, but what you'll see is this sort of whitish plaque uh, in the back of their mouth, sort of where their tonsils are, and that is a sign of diphtheria. Uh, and so this is still a common cause in the developing world. The characteristic symptom of laryngitis is hoarseness. So most of us have had laryngitis at some point in our life, and it's basically you just lose your voice and you, you become very hoarse. Um, but hoarseness can be a feature of other syndromes as well. So thinking about adults, for instance, adults can get hoarseness from gastric reflux disease. Uh, you can also get hoarseness from laryngeal masses, uh, from subglottic stenosis, from vocal cord paralysis. Uh, you can even get some degree of hoarseness from croup and epiglottitis as well. So while laryngitis practically always has hoarseness as a feature, hoarseness is not uh, definitive for laryngitis. Okay, so let's look at the typical clinical course and then some other symptoms and physical exam features that will focus you on laryngitis. So the onset of laryngitis it usually follows some sort of nonspecific upper respiratory tract infection, usually what the patient will refer to like as a head cold or common cold or just a, just a chest congestion. Uh, so usually it will follow a nonspecific upper respiratory tract infection and then it's followed by the classic symptoms. And by classic symptoms, we're talking about hoarseness, and then sore throat, cough, and then some of these other more nonspecific things like rhinorrhea, postnasal discharge, fatigue, and malaise. The hoarseness is going to be the salient feature, and this is going to be out of proportion to the clinical presentation and systemic symptoms. So it's not common for a patient with laryngitis to have fever. This really is not a systemic uh, disease. This is something that's very localized into the larynx. Uh, so you have hoarseness, but other than that, the patient looks to be well. Uh, and this contrasts to things such as maybe croup more so, bacterial tracheitis, certainly epiglottitis, where the patient oftentimes looks ill. Respiratory distress is very unusual in children and adults, but in the very, very young patients, uh, you can see respiratory distress, and at that point, you would need to intervene, you know, usually by uh, inserting an orotracheal tube. Physical exam is not going to give you much. Uh, if you look into the back of the throat uh, with your tongue depressor, you may see some evidence of pharyngeal edema, but that's about it. Diagnosis, as you can probably imagine, is clinical. So you can culture the oropharynx to rule out an upper respiratory tract infection if there appears to be an exudate, but really you shouldn't start any antibiotics unless the cultures come back positive. Remember, laryngitis is a viral cause. So we're really just doing this the way we're approaching laryngitis is just make sure that the patient doesn't have any symptoms of other diseases that can present with voice loss. And usually it's pretty apparent, but if there are any, if there's anything such as uh, se severe respiratory distress, or if there's muffled voice or drooling or uh, an unusual sounding cough, then you're going to want to do tests that will rule out things such as croup and epiglottitis, bacterial tracheitis, and so forth. Uh, however, your presentation for laryngitis is typically pretty uh, classic. So the differential diagnosis for laryngitis, of course, is going to include foreign body aspiration. You should be able to uh, get that out of your history. This also uh, tends to be very sudden, whereas laryngitis sort of has that prodromal course where you have the upper respiratory tract infection that usually precedes it for some time. Angioedema can uh, cause a swelling, and uh, usually a patient will have a history of angioedema, usually even a family history. Uh, there'll be a specific trigger, even if the patient doesn't know that. Uh, if you look at the skin and the hands, you'll see hives, urticaria. Uh, you can see swelling of the hands and feet, and a lot of times these patients will be in respiratory distress. And any time a patient is in respiratory distress, and by respiratory distress, I mean that the patient uh, is not saturating well, they're using accessory muscles of respiration, there's nasal flaring, they're assuming unusual positions like a tripod position, 
um, which usually signals epiglottitis, or they're drooling, all of that is going to make you decide that we need to intubate these patients. So always err on the side of intubation if you're not sure. Reflux laryngitis is something that is different from viral laryngitis, although ultimately we're going to treat them the same way. Um, you might get a history of reflux uh, in, in the patient's history. Um, if the patient does indeed have laryngitis and they have gastric reflux disease, then what else are you gonna do? Of course, you're gonna treat the gastric reflux disease too. Uh, diphtheria is rare in the US. Uh, it's what you'll see is a whitish gray plaque, usually visible on the tonsils and the oropharynx. They also have some swelling around the neck and it causes them to have what's called a bull neck. A retropharyngeal abscess tends to present with drooling and dysphagia, and it does not improve with typical laryngitis treatment. So again, something like drooling, you're not just gonna work it up and say, boom, laryngitis. If there's drooling, you're going to want to do more for the patient. Uh, making sure that you're getting, uh, that you get a, uh, a stable airway, and then do some pictures. Uh, AP x-ray, uh, lateral x-ray of the neck, get some pictures and that can point you in, uh, in the right direction. Extrinsic compression, uh, this can be from a lot of different things, uh, but what we know is that this does not improve with typical laryngitis treatment. Okay, so here's some differentials to keep in mind. Uh, usually laryngitis is pretty clear though, but having a good history, uh, writing down all the symptoms that the patient has had and doing a good physical will really help. The treatment for laryngitis is conservative, humidified air and vocal rest so you can usually, uh, in the clinic, in the hospital, uh, you, can give them, uh, you can give them humidified air via like a nebulizer, and that should help to a certain degree. Uh, also, if they smoke, which most kids don't smoke, but if this is an older kid or an adult with laryngitis, you'll want them to stop smoking. And parents should stop smoking in the house if they do that. That's just gonna delay the recovery. Another thing that can be used, uh, because these patients tend to cough a lot, uh, you can use mucolytics such as white venison. Uh, that's over-the-counter drugs. So you don't need to write a prescription for that. As I mentioned, in cases where reflux laryngitis is suspected, such as there's a concurrent history of GERD, you can use a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, you should use a proton pump inhibitor uh, to prevent future episodes. So something like a meprazole or something like that. Symptoms should have completely resolved within three weeks, although usually they resolve a lot faster than that. If the symptoms persist beyond this point, then the diagnosis shifts to chronic laryngitis and these patients need to be referred to otolaryngology. So this is the normal vocal cords. You're looking uh, down here. And then these are inflamed. So this is just, all this is here is an illustration. And you're looking, this is what it looked like through a laryngoscope. So here's your vocal cords here. So here's a healthy, healthy vocal cords. They should have this sort of grayish pink appearance. And then um, surrounding that, you have this sort of nice reddish pinkish appearance. Now you'll see here, that this obviously looks much different. Uh, the vocal cords uh, start to look a lot more like that surrounding tissue. You see some, uh, some erythema of the vocal cords. Um, you also see uh, sort of some, look like some vessels forming around it. And so, uh, and these are also very swollen too. So if you look at the size, they're swollen. So that hypervascularity is one sign of laryngitis and then sort of that color change.